Hey world, Dan Brown here with another edition of EDH Rec Tech, the Magic the Gathering deck building show where we focus on the variant known as Elder Dragon Highlander. That's what EDH stands for, uh, and where I use the popular online deck building tool known as EDH Rec uh, to uh, give my opinions, emphasis, emphasis on them being opinions, as to what the masses seem to be doing well and what the masses seem to be doing poorly uh, as it relates to specific commanders. In this case, commanders plural, because we'll be looking at Sidar and Ludovic. Um, quick refresher on just how EDH rec works. It uh, has thousands, thousands of crowdsourced deck lists that it uses uh, in a big database. It susses out information that it spits out on uh, individual landing pages for each and every commander and combination of partner commanders that is possible. And you can look at that and see what people are doing, what, what ideas exist out there for cards that uh, maybe you've never heard of or maybe just never thought of in a particular context. You might use to you know build the deck for the first time or make changes to a deck you already have in existence. Uh, it's pretty cool. And there's a section called Signature Cards, and that looks at cards that are disproportionately prevalent in given commander's decks as compared to other decks in the same color identity. Uh, and uh, I I'm going to be looking at those cards. Those are the cards I'm going to be looking at to tell you what the masses are doing well, what they're doing poorly. Real quick, uh, Ludovic, Sidar. Well, maybe less real quick. I'm going to back up. Normally, I I if you've been watching previous episodes this season, you know that I've been harping away on how top-down this series is like I start with a commander and then I build the deck around them which lends itself to kind of generic play styles general good stuff I'm just trying to help you build a good deck once you've already decided the commander but that's not the only way to build a deck right you can start with individual card synergies or an, just a particular idea not knowing yet who you want your commander to be, or commanders, as it happens in this case. Uh, and so that that's how I got into building this deck. I actually own this deck in paper. Most of the decks in the series uh, only exist uh, for me in Cockatrice and on the internet now. Um, but this deck I did build out in paper because I ran into uh, a situation where I was playing in a brand new LGS. I, I moved to Pittsburgh a little over a year ago. It takes some time to get settled in and to uh, be ready to build Magic the Gathering back into your life every once in a while. That's how, that's how it went for me anyway. Uh, but so I showed up and I didn't know cool, quite what the uh, power level would be. And um, I think I found a particularly underpowered pod as it happened. Uh, I just showed up pretty early and they were the first ones there. Uh, and so decks that I brought that I thought were pretty casual, like no combos, trying to win with damage. Like the sort of decks that you would see in EDH Rec Tech for the most part. Um, were just too too good. We played three games and I won all three of them and you know I was nice about it and they you know I, I think that yeah we're we're on good terms. We'll play more games of magic. They were very uh, uh, sportsmanlike. But at the same time I w I wasn't prepared for the meta game. So <laughs> I think they were newer players. They probably didn't have big card pools to uh, choose from. They were basically playing cards that I assume they had gotten in drafts over the last few months. Uh, so there was just no real way for them to compete on you know, power level-wise with someone who's been playing for years and years and years and has a pretty big collection. Uh, so I went home, and this is... Like, I never want to deliberately build a bad deck. I feel like... There is a social con, or there's a, like there's a social contract, right? Un unwritten, but that everyone in an EDH pod should be at least trying, like trying to win. I, I don't like chaos decks. I don't like like people who put together. Well, I mean, the people might be fine, but I don't like the decks that they've put together uh, that are trying to just derail the game entirely. Like that. That's not why we all came together to do so. Like we should all be at least ostensibly trying to win. Uh, and, and I yeah, I don't like going against good deck building principles when I'm building a deck. So how, how, how on earth do I build a deck tapping into my collection uh, and not going against like deeply ingrained principles? You know, run a lot of ramp, run a lot of control, uh, run a lot of card draw, <laughs> and, and try to win but in a way that is fun for everyone. So, so this is the idea I came up with. This is a long way to tell you that I decided I wanted to build a group slug pillow fort deck. That was the first thing I decided. 
and then I went searching for commanders. Uh, well, I went searching for colors first, I should say. I just went through an advanced search. Um, I think it's like magiccards.info, very good search engine for cards, um, and started accumulating all the uh, pillow fort effects, all the effects that kind of incentivize opponents to attack each other. Um, and from there, I figured out that I wanted to be four color, everything but black. Black does have a few... Um, cards that might be able to fit into this nicely but uh, these two commanders lend themselves very well to a group slug strategy as it is Ludovic incentivizes your opponents to attack each other and Sadar if I'm being perfectly honest he's mostly there for his colors um, but enabling your opponent's dorks to get through easily is not irrelevant um, we're, we're trying to build up pillow fort effects in this deck right make it very hard for opponents to attack us meanwhile incentivizing lots and lots of attacks so that they have to attack each other uh, and and that's the idea behind the deck uh, it does not have very many win conditions i'm trying to help my opponents kill each other while I sit back safely and watch and then actually winning the game is maybe a little difficult for this deck uh, but second place is victory uh, <laughs> is the way you kind of have to look at it uh, so in four color decks there aren't very many signature cards to go over um, I actually emailed Donald at EDH rec and I'll get a little more into that email thread a little bit later into the series um, but he was saying that right because the signature cards come from comparisons to other decks in the same color identity there just aren't very many four color options for commanders right now uh, if anyone from wizards of the coast is watching this maybe consider printing a few more four color uh, commander options uh, if for no other reason then uh, it would help us have more data about the four color decks that already exist by way of comparison but uh, let, let, let's get into these let's get into these um, first of all Edric Spymaster of Trest. Super good card, EDH staple, a very, very strong commander in his own right. Looks a little bit like James Comey. A little bit. And, and you know, the flavor text is not totally uh, out of character for a Comey-type character. I digress. Uh, so, yeah, I am running this in my Sidar and Ludovic build. Uh, it's just exactly what we want. We want to incentivize our opponents to attack each other and not us. Uh, and Edric does that very well. He also enables us to draw cards. Uh, we, we do have you know, two commanders, at least, as creatures. Not, not running a super heavy number of creatures in my Sadar and Ludovic build, uh, as opposed to most people who are running Sadar and Ludovic, as evidenced by um, the rest of the signature cards here. Grenzo Havoc Razor, 2-2, two -two, so... Uh, What's that? Sadar would make him unblockable, attacking our opponents, which is very good with his abilities. Um, yeah, if you're running a sort of weenie style deck, that is to say small creatures, um, then Grenzo makes a lot of sense in Sadar and Ludovic. Uh, you want to be careful that you're not uh, putting yourself at risk of being blown out, but Grenzo uh, replaces himself pretty effectively uh yeah if you have a lot of creatures or a way to make lots of little creatures like you know a token strategy yeah grenzo makes lots of sense i am not running him because that's not the sort of deck i'm trying to build i'm doing more of a pillow fort control thing but you know it makes a lot of sense uh okay let's see if i can pronounce this kineos and tiro of miletus that's my best guess uh very i mean it's it's well okay let me back up it's the only non-partner option for this four color combination and at first as i was building out this bottom up deck strategy uh, i thought that they would be my commanders uh, until i found sadar and ludovic so you know obviously it makes sense they're in the same colors you get a lot of value when you're paying four different colors of mana for a four drop creature right this is a disproportionately strong effect to have staple to a creature at four cmc because it's just such a difficult four cmc to hit um i with that said i'm not running it this was one of the last cuts I made. Uh, it, it definitely could go with the strategy that I have chosen to pursue, but at the end of the day, um, I had to pick a few things to cut. And, um, like, when I run group hug decks, I'm not just hugging opponents with wanton disregard for how exactly that hug is going down, okay? I, I don't want to feed them so many resources and so much mana, so many cards that the, the game still slips away from me, right? I, because part of that social contract I was talking about earlier, I, I am still trying to win, ostensibly. I don't have very many ways to do it. 
and when it happens in this deck, it, it, it'll be like kind of weird and quirky. Uh, but like I am trying to get there, and if I feed my opponents too much extra mana and too many extra cards, then uh, we can start running into situations where we just uh, lose agency in the game. Uh, so uh, I, I, I had to choose basically, do I want to feed my opponents cards or do I want to feed my opponents mana? Uh, and I think the obvious answer was cards. Uh, they can supply their own mana and, and that's a way to help them play lots of attackers that can only attack each other uh, without <laughs> letting them build that board out so fast that we can't build a reliable pillow fort before they start swinging with big, big beaters. Uh, oh, also mad props to Wizards of the Coast for uh, inclusion here, uh, making up for lost time. Really appreciate it. Uh, this is not a uh, it's not a group that I belong to, but just as someone who wants to see you know the magic playing population of the planet more uh, closely correlate to the population of the planet <laughs> and their demographics. Uh, yeah, it's just important to it's important to send signals to the world that it's not just for white dudes like me. Uh, straight white dudes like me. Anyway, Mentor of the Meek. Uh, yeah, very good card. Again, if you're doing a weenie sort of strategy, then, yeah, this card replaces itself, and that's the most important thing we look for in any card that we're playing. Uh, and it replaces itself many times over. This can be a very reliable draw engine in a deck with lots of um, either 2-2 two -two creatures printed as cards or tokens. This would be good in a token strategy. That might be one direction to take a Sadar and Ludovic build, not the direction I have taken it in, because I'm getting weird with it. That's that's all the signature cards we have. Uh, there they are, one more time. We're going to move on to this deck tech now. EDH rec tech deck tech. Sadar and Ludovic, or as I'm calling it, Sid and Lude make it weird. It's a, it's a good title. It's a group slug pillow fort deck, like I said, and it cares more about playing interesting games than winning, although it is still trying to win, ostensibly. It, you know, it has ways to win, and it is trying to create a situation in the long run where it eventually gets there, but it's more about being able to sit down at a p table with anyone and uh, leave an impression without making the game unfun. Like, I think this does make the game fun. It'll be a different sort of game, any sort of accelerated game messes with your opponent's ideas of uh, what a curve looks like. But the goal here is to feed opponent's cards with hug effects and then make them attack each other with our spiders, curses, and pillows. All right, spiders uh, refers to any death touch reach slash flying blocker. Uh, I find that that is perhaps a stronger disincentive to attacking us than even pillow effects like propaganda, things that you know, force your opponents to pay mana to attack with a single creature. Um, and curses are ways to incentivize them to attack each other. A cursed player uh, has an ability that you know, says whenever you are attacked, the person attacking you gets XYZ bonus. Right? And there's one for, there are a couple in each color, I think. And then Insurrection and Keening Stone are the only win conditions in the deck. Maybe, maybe you can count Forced Fruition? among them, but so Insurrection gains control of all creatures, untaps them, and gives them haste. Uh, so if we're feeding our opponents lots of cards, uh, meanwhile they're not able to attack us, they're attacking each other, getting each other's life totals really low, and then we just take all their creatures and do one big swing. That's uh, <laughs> the one way I have ever won with this deck in paper. It was pretty cool. Uh, Keening Stone uh, it is a way to mill your opponent's uh, on a stick, you I think it's I think it's like six mana to cast and five mana to activate. Uh, we'll see that in a second. But uh, tap it and target opponent or target player puts cards into their graveyard equal to the number of cards in their graveyard off the top of their library. So uh, very quickly, if they have more cards in their graveyard than their library, it immediately mills them out. Um, and in a deck that has been playing kind of a slow roll pillow fort group hug sort of thing, uh, it's not beyond the realm of possibility that the game would go so long that someone would have 50 plus cards in their graveyard. Uh, and forced fruition, whenever your opponent casts a spell, they draw seven cards. They must. So it, it creates a really weird uh, <laughs> puzzle for your opponents to solve if you're feeding them tons and tons and tons of cards, but they only really get to cast a couple more spells in the whole game before they mill themselves out. Uh, I, I haven't actually gotten it to go off in paper. I don't think I've ever drawn into it. 
but could be good, I think. So here are the fundamentals. Ramp, uh, we have 13, that's an average amount. Uh, pretty normal green ramp suite. We're not hugging with our ramp. The original, original first pass at this deck did have kind of a group hug ramp suite instead of a normal one, but like I was saying earlier, you gotta, you gotta kind of pick how you're gonna hug if you're still trying to win. Uh, because otherwise the game can get out of control pretty quickly. Um, draw effects, we have 16 of them, an average amount. Uh, that might be slightly above average, I don't really know, but I I'm marking it as average here because they're all hug effects, so they're not really gaining us card advantage over our opponents, but they just ensure that we are consistently able to do what we're trying to do as are our opponents at that point. And it, it makes opponents' draw effects less good, in a way, uh, because if they're already drawing tons of cards, then any of their like big splashy card draw effects are just like proportionately less good in this particular game. Uh, just something to think about. And control, uh, we have a below average amount of control uh, at 12 control effects. And I'm kind of definition, I'm kind of definitioning stretch. I don't what, words sometimes mouth out come weird. We're stretching the definition of control. Okay, it's not cyclonic rift and counter spell. All right, it's, it's not chaos warp. It's um. Well, it's, it's ways to make opponents' creatures a little bit brainwashed. I should really make the font smaller on these, huh? Well, too late now. Set up with ramp effects and incentives to attack other players. Start hugging to create a big board, meanwhile casting more pillows, curses, and spiders. And uh, watch your opponents destroy each other while you sit on an insurrection and or keening stone. Hey, hey, I have an idea. How about after I show you this deck, you go buy it? All right, go to flipsidegaming.com and you buy the deck with real money in, and you get a real paper deck and you use the promo code POGO. That would help support EDH Rec Tech and other content on Pogo Bat Gaming, help incentivize me to attack your opponents. I mean, help incentivize me to uh, continue making Pogo Bat Gaming content. Yeah, they're just a, an LGS up in upstate New York uh, trying to build out their online presence. And uh, hey, I'm trying to build out my Magic the Gathering related online presence too. So makes a ton of sense. Use the promo code POGO uh, and I'll get a cut of whatever you buy from them. Uh, also, okay, so this deck is a bottom up deck, but most of the decks in EDH Rec Tech are going to be top-down design, so I want for my follow-up series to do a few videos where uh, rather than starting with a, a given commander or a set of commanders, we start with a cool card synergy that you would like to see my take on a deck for that, that, that has been built around like that synergy, right? So send me an email, danbrownuniverse at gmail.com, with your favorite Synergies. <laughs> Synergies you want to see me build decks around. And uh, if it's one of the 12 best, I probably, I will, in my opinion. It's all my, these are all my opinions. Okay, just opinions. I, I never claim to be the best Magic player of all time. I'm, I'm not. That John Finkel. That's John Finkel, isn't it? That's his name, right? Uh, where were we? Oh, hey, yeah, let's look at this deck. Okay, let's look at this deck. All right, let's get started with the mana base for Sid and Lude. Command Tower. You know what this card does in four-color decks. Very strong. Evolving Wilds. It's a tempo loss, but uh, in four colors, again, we are hard-pressed for the fixing. Uh, so we're using it, particularly in this deck, uh, because, we, uh, I mean, all EDH rec tech decks <laughs> are uh, on a pseudo-budget. This deck is very much on a budget because we're not trying to be even, like, remotely competitive, really. Like, we're trying to win, I guess. But we're more so trying to just uh, make a weird game state. So uh, the, the mana base here is super bare-bones for four colors. Um, Exotic Orchard, uh, one of the few good lands we run. And then we just run uh, basics, a bunch of forests, a bunch of islands. Uh, in the middle there, alphabetically, we have Mikokoro, Center of the Sea, plays into the group slug um, game plan. Again, we're not trying to ramp our opponents with mana, we're just trying to feed them cards, and uh, this is better than like a Howling Mine, because we can control when the group hug happens, namely either during our turn with lots of mana up, or uh, preferably the end step of the opponent right before us, right? Uh, then we have Mountains, then we have Plains, um, a Terramorphic Expanse, which, you know, functionally the same as Evolving Wilds, and then a cycle, other than the black one, obviously, of the Vivids. Vivid Crag, Vivid Creek, Vivid Grove, Vivid Meadow. They enter tapped tempo loss, uh, but they are perfect color fixing at least twice, and usually 
you don't need these for longer than that uh, because you'll have found some sort of a ramp effect that fixes your mana anyway. The only downside, obviously, again, entering tapped. Here we have the ramp effects for Sid and Lude uh, Chromatic Lantern in four colors. It's just very good to have our lands tap for any color. Um, yeah, three or more color decks really should run this card. It's maybe on the bubble of being $15, uh, but I think it is just under, so it, it does qualify. Helm of Awakening, one of the few effects that we do have in here that ramps all of our opponents a little bit, but uh, the idea is that it benefits us first, right? If we can play it for two mana, usually we will save more than two mana that very same turn if it's you know mid game or late game uh, soul ring if you haven't heard of this card i don't know why you're watching a video about edh sakura tribe elder steve you know it's typical two mana ramp spell in green fertile ground um, same thing. Boundless Realms is so good. Uh, I love running four or five color decks that are still mostly basic lands just to prove that it can be done. Uh, not that hard to build a four or five color mana base if you're in a punchy battle cruiser meta. If you're in a more competitive meta, then sure, being tied up turns two and three can be super relevant. But you know, for what we're trying to do, this card in this deck uh, is a, a blowout. It's a way to make the pillow fort that much more difficult to penetrate, just have such a huge advantage in terms of the number of lands that we have, meanwhile not being attacked. Just, just, a, just a way to... Um, it, it, it's not inevitability, it's kind of the opposite of that. It makes it inevitable that you can't develop inevitability against us. Um, cultivate Gold standard, deep reconnaissance, I like it because you can do it twice, and this deck uh, loves searching for basics. Far seek, uh, gold standard again. Tempt with discovery, this one is a little bit of a group hug effect, but, you know, it's group slug because every opponent that uh, chooses to do it, it gets you, you know, it, 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 it disproportionately benefits you, obviously. Recross the paths, this one, a little bit more of a uh, corner card, a lot of people haven't heard of it. Um, you would be amazed as to how often you lose the clash. But when you don't, it's just like you get it back. It's awesome. Uh, and you get a scry one at the end. I mean, the clash is basically a pseudo scry one. So, yeah, this card is really good. If you haven't heard of it, definitely consider it. It's not terribly expensive. I mean, it's an uncommon. So you can pick it up. Rampant growth and Kadama's reach. You know what those do? That's how we ramp. Pretty normal green ramp suite, despite the deck being weird. Getting into the card draw effects, this is where the deck starts to get like a little bit weird. Uh, Farsight Mask first in alphabetical order, at least for artifacts. Um, yeah, a, a pseudo pillow fort effect. It creates a disincentive to attacking us right anytime we are successfully attacked. Uh, we will draw cards from it. So why not attack an opponent instead? Although, you know, sometimes y you'll have situations where this is in play and you actually want to be attacked because you want to refill your hand uh, and so you can work something out with an opponent who has like a 1-1 one, one or a 2-2. Two, two. Um, Font of Mythos, just a double Howling Mine pretty good horn of greed uh, like this one even better than a howling mine because we benefit from it first right font of mythos and howling mine um, the opponent whose turn comes immediately after ours is the first to draw so we want to make sure that we already have some semblance of pillow fort established before we uh, play effects like font of mythos howling mine but horn of greed you know we draw first uh, we might be tied up mana wise after we draw you know after we cast this if it's mid game but still we benefit from it first. Horn of Plenty, uh, you know, similar thing. This one maybe is a bubble card, but it's uh, it's just good for group hugging. Anytime a player plays a spell, pay one. They draw a card at end of turn. Means that we won't. Well, you know, if we draw some sort of like instant speed effect, but this deck is hard pressed for instant speed effects. So I would generally wait again with this until I have some amount of pillow fort already online um, well of knowledge yeah you know a group hug card draw again it benefits the opponent after us first temple bell benefits us first right because we're gonna wait the entirety of the turn cycle until the the, the last end step before our untap to activate this okay you can also activate it on your turn in a pinch uh, and there again is the howling mine creature wise for card draw you know group hug card draw Edric, great, great, great commander in his own right. An excellent way to incentivize opponents attacking each other instead of you. That's kind of the whole idea here. Uh, yeah, perfect fit in this deck. We love it. Can draw us lots of cards. You know, I mean, both of our commanders are uh, great at swinging in. They both have power two or less, which means that Siddhar uh, makes them unblockable for our opponents. 
Uh, unless our you know, opponents have flying, but they're much, much more difficult to block. And Kami of the Crescent Moon, Howling Mine with Legs, less good. It's also very color-specific, uh, although then again, Kami can swing in if you have an Edric on board, so uh, maybe better in some ways. Dictate of Crufix, better than Howling Mine because we flash it in the end step before our turn and we draw from it first, right? It's all about who Ben Qui Bonum first, however you say first in Latin. Rights of Flourishing, uh, again, we like this because we can play the land first at the very least. The opponents will draw before we do, um, but you know, Rights of Flourishing, not bad. Trying to group hug, unifying theory. Oh, I'll back up. Rights of Flourishing, one of the few ways that we can allow our opponents to um, ramp extra with our pseudo hug slash slug, but um, you know, as long as we're measured in the number of ramp effects we have it's still contributing to the basic game plan without things you know ideally getting out of hand right group hug can get out of hand you can lose control of the situation very quickly if you're hugging too much too fast without setting up some way to mitigate that unifying theory again just a way to draw more cards pay two whenever you play a spell they draw a card well of ideas i like i mean this one is kind of perfect for a group slug idea because you benefit twice as much and you get that immediate value when it enters the battlefield so it it gets around the biggest drawback on howling mine if howling mine had a draw a card etb it would be i mean it would be good in non-hug decks at that point i would say uh you know certain sorts of it i don't want to get into what exactly that'd be right now don't have time but skyscribing yep another group hug draw effect mine's a glow same thing Fascination uh, is group hug, and it can also, uh, you know, help us potentially win. One of the two win conditions in this deck um, is Keening Stone, which mills our opponents. So making them mill X cards, followed by a Keening Stone, can maybe be uh, that this can maybe be the difference between Keening Stone being almost lethal and Keening Stone being fully lethal. So. A uh, little extra utility on what is otherwise just a group hug draw effect like so many others. So we're really stretching pretty thin the definition of control here in Sidar and Ludovic, but uh, this is our control in quotes uh, suite. First up is Deadly Recluse. One, two, reach death touch. I mean, the whole idea here is that we create a safe space for our, ourselves to just sit back and watch our opponents deal with each other with their punchy battle cruiser decks and uh, a, a, a reachy slash flying death toucher is so 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 good for just encouraging opponents to go a, a different direction and it has the added bonus of like not feeling as though we have uh, affronted anyone we haven't targeted any opponent's creatures with removal spells right a laser cannon that's not pointed at your face and is it pointed at one of your opponent's faces from a different opponent is basically your laser cannon and this is just a really subtle way to point it in a different direction no one's going to swing in with their super valuable creature if it's just gonna die because you block it with your spider so yeah i mean it, it's like it's like multiple removal spells in one you know, best case scenario. I mean, worst case scenario is you just lose it as collateral damage in a board wipe. But best case scenario, if it influences multiple attacks, it's almost like you were packing like five removal spells in one two drop creature. Super good. Hornet Queen, same idea. It creates four flying death touchers when it enters. Costs seven mana, so you're not going to get there right away. Um, but definitely an excellent addition to um, any. Pillow Fort, Thornwield Archer, uh, same exact idea. Winged Quaddle has Flash, which makes it you know, even more so a pseudo removal spell. Although, yeah, it might be better to just cast it on your main phase and leave it in play so that your opponents choose not to attack you in the first place, right? By the time they're attacking you, it's already too late. You'd rather not lose your Quaddle and leave it just, you know, sitting out there. Um, but anyway, still, same thing. Three mana, not a bad price. Then, um, <laughs> Continuing our uh, mission to stretch the definition of control, we have uh, the cycle of vow enchantments, other than the black one here. Uh, the, you know, as I was building this deck, I got to thinking, these are pretty good, even if you're not trying to group slug. Like, very techy play, you know, a line of play, and an include that people might not see coming, would be packing some of these vows in your other decks 
for the same reason you know that I was talking about with the recluse, an opponent's laser cannon that's pointed at another opponent is really your laser cannon. Why remove an opponent's creature when you can just prevent it from ever doing anything to you? Right, that's even better than removing it in a lot of situations. So plus two plus two flying has to attack opponents. Vow of duty it gives it vigilance. Has to attack opponents. Vow of wildness. Trample plus three plus three. Vow of lightning plus two plus two and first strike. Just a little bit of a boost uh, that you know helps them attack. Now the 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 armor in this picture does not make any sense. Why would you leave that much? Um, skin exposed while protecting so much other... And anyway, anyway. Spectral Grasp, um, yeah, same exact thing. I mean, this card is really good. Pacifism, but why not let it continue to attack your other opponents? Um, then finally, uh, Aetherize. This actually is just a, a, a pseudo-removal. A it's a control effect, right? And it fits with the theme of the deck. Even if you pay for the pillow fort taxes that we'll get to in a minute, even if you decide it's worth swinging into the deadly recluse, we can we can make you wish you hadn't. We can create a major tempo swing and make you reconsider who you're attacking next time via Aetherize. Arachnogenesis, um, it's just like a fog effect that then gives us a whole bunch of reachy blockers. Granted, these reachy blockers do not have death touch. That would be very overpowered, but um, still good. And Illusionist's Gambit, you know, same idea as Aetherize, right? It fits with the flavor, it fits with the idea of the deck, right? Are you sure you want to attack me? No, actually, you're attacking a different opponent, even though you decided you were sure you wanted to attack me. Just, you know, <laughs> even when they get through the pillow fort, they can't get through because we run Aetherize and Illusionist's Gambit. Here we have uh, what I call pillows and curses. Uh, there are ways to incentivize attacking opponents and disincentivize attacking us. Tomato, tomato, you be the judge. I'm not sure. They're kind of different things. Norn's Annex, just a standard issue pillow fort effect, creating attacks for people to attack us, either one white mana or two life. So usually that's going to be two life because, uh, you know, odds are, you know, one out of five or whatever. We don't, and then mo most decks, I'd say, most decks are not white are not in white and don't have a way to make white mana readily available. Uh, I digress. Pillow Fort Effect. Fog Bank, just to, it fits with the theme, right? You know, you swing in, oh, your attack did nothing. Might as well attack someone else. Windborn Muse, a uh, pillow effect stapled to a creature, so slightly less good because it can die as collateral damage in board wipes, but still, you know, a way to disincentivize attacking us. And also, you're not a bad block. Two, three flying blocker, you know, worst case we chump and, you know, we prevent people from swinging in with little things anyway, or a faction. Uh, this card is weird. If you have it out, then people can get through once, or creatures can get through once, but why would you want to do that? Then it can't attack anyone else ever again. Uh, usually, if this is in play, people will choose to attack other opponents. Collective Restraint, this is super good. Um, a little bit spendier than some of the cards, but again, everything's under $15. Uh, the X is 4 here, so for 4 mana, you have created a 4 mana tax, which is... Twice as big of a tax as like Ghostly Prison and Propaganda for only one more mana. Uh, very, very, very strong. Yeah, usually you'll have four basic land types. Curse of Bounty. Ways to incentivize opponents attacking each other instead of you. Um, although you do get a benefit from this too. But if your board is not too threatening, which it almost never will be because we're not running any like big bomby creatures, opponents shouldn't care too much about you getting a bonus and them being able to untap all their non-land permanents will often be... Uh, just too juicy to pass up, right? That extra mana. Untapping your soul ring alone can open up a lot of second main phase opportunities. Curse of Inertia, uh, maybe not quite as good as the Curse of Bounty, but again, a way to incentivize some attacks against your opponents. Curse of Opulence, uh, doesn't hurt to be throwing, uh, throwing gold around. I almost called it a treasure. It is, I mean, it's a treasure, right? It's the same thing, I guess. I don't know. Do you have to tap a treasure? I forget. Curse of Predation. Uh, again, your creatures get bigger when you attack an opponent. Um, curse of Verbosity. Drawing cards. This is probably my favorite of the curses just because I love drawing cards so darn much. Ghostly Prison and Propaganda. Functionally the same. One is white and one is blue, uh, but uh, costs two mana to attack you with a single creature. Part of the Pillow Fort. Sandworm Convergence. Love this card. It's a newer one. Uh, nothing with without flying can attack you. Or sorry, yeah, nothing with flying can attack you. 
and it gives you a big juicy ground blocker uh, at the end of your turn, <laughs> in a pinch, you know, if you get to an end game and, they, and they've somehow dealt with your insurrection and keening stone, these five five green worms can be uh, the grindy way that eventually you squeak out a victory in this deck. Although, again, the real win condition is having the most fun. Okay, and the real game is the meta game. Sphere of safety, uh, another just like gold standard in pillow fort effects. That X can often be. Four, five, six. If you have uh, you know, also the enchantments that prevent your opponent's creatures from attacking you, you know this this deck is pretty enchantment heavy. So sphere of safety is very good. And finally, in our pursuit to make it weird, we have what I call grease and win conditions. First up in alphabetical order is an artifact. It's Keening Stone, one of those win conditions I was talking about. If you've been, you know, drawing your opponent's cards all game while staying safe in your own pillow fort, uh, this eventually becomes viable. Like, eventually your opponents have more cards in their graveyard than in their library. And if not, like immediately, you can activate this on an end step and then activate it during a main phase to all but knock somebody out. They will get an upkeep, so maybe they can do something with it. But uh, yeah, one of our very few win conditions. Um, forced fruition makes that Keening Stone that much more viable, obviously. But uh, yeah, kind of a prototypical group slug effect, taking an advantage so far to an extreme that it, it becomes a disadvantage. Um, effectively, what this says is your opponents can only cast a couple more spells this game before it starts to be a real problem for them uh, until they deal with forced fruition, But uh, which... I guess often they will, but it, it creates a it, it's it's a hard card for opponents to analyze because the first time they cast a spell they love it, but it, it just it, it sneaks up on them. And you know, again, we don't care so much if they're drawing a ton of cards because they're going to use those cards to go after each other, especially if we have a grand melee in play. Uh, you know, trying to force our opponents to attack and to block it, this can really gum up the works. This really throws off how people assess how good creatures are. Like, your really great value engine that's a 2-2 isn't very good with a grand melee in play because it has to it has to block, you know, or it has to attack into a, a creature that has to block. Um, mass hysteria, yeah, again, just greasing the gears, giving them all haste. If you got mass hysteria and grand melee, it's really just confusing. Do you want to build a board? Do you want to put a creature out there? I mean, for us, it's a moot point. Like, we're just watching our opponents swing at each other because hopefully we have some of those enchantments in play making it hard to swing at us. Um, Possibility Storm, this is my favorite card. Uh, it's a pet card, so I do look for excuses to kind of shoehorn it into decks. And my excuse for this deck <laughs> is, I mean, one, we're trying to make it weird. Definitely makes it weird. But moreover, um, it, it does help us. It creates a, a game state where everyone is just kind of blindly building a board. Uh, it, it tends to create a more permanent, heavy, less interactive game, which I know interaction is the whole reason that games are fun. Uh, but um, if uh, yeah, if people are just casting kind of random spells, it, it you know, control effects aren't nearly as good, and uh, threats tend to stay on the board longer, and so the you know it becomes a more permanent, heavy board, which hopefully helps our opponents attack each other to death until. We are the ones doing the attacking via an insurrection. Uh, this is the primary win condition in a battle cruiser meta. Uh, it's a very good one. Uh, maybe less so the closer you get to a control meta or a combo meta. But uh, you know, yeah, th th this is the, usually the best way to try to win a game or at least knock out an opponent uh, in a game. If Sid and Lude makes it weird, is the deck you're piloting for some reason. <laughs> Let's see how Sadar and Ludovic do. Maybe they can win a one-on-zero game, right? Uh, uh, uh. All right, let's see how Sadar and Ludovic do. Maybe they can win a, a one-on-zero game here. We'll draw our opening hand, which is weird. That is five lands, no ramp effects. Uh, yeah, no, no, I don't think we can keep that. We'll take our free mulligan, draw back up. That seems pretty good. We have a game plan. We can cast almost everything in our hand uh, with other things in our hand. So we'll go ahead and say turn one, draw for turn, uh, main phase. I'll play a forest, pass turn, go to turn two, uh, draw once again, main phase, play that Mikokoro, and then for two mana, 
Uh, we're just going to cast a Rampant Growth. The Helm of Awakening might get our opponents. It would benefit our opponents first in this situation, which is what we're trying to avoid with our group hug effects. Um, an island is definitely what we're in need of most here. <laughs> or another forest to hit that Hornet Queen later, although this Chromatic Lantern is going to fix our mana pretty perfectly regardless. So turn three, untap, draw another forest, which is fine because we have a chromatic lantern sort out my lands there a little bit play this forest we have four mana available we're going to use one two three uh to drop that chromatic lantern and then for one two it'll be a thorn wheeled archer really incentivizing opponents to attack each other instead of us i'll just i'll block your big fat flyer with a two one reach death touch and kill it i'll kill it dead so don't you dare come this way let's go to turn four Untap everything, draw a planes. Nothing uh, nothing too shabby in the planes there. We got six mana available to us, uh, which would be enough to flash in a dictate a crucifix on our end step after playing a Ludovic. We would analyze the board here a little bit, right? Chromatic Lantern gives us uh, the mana that we need. Um, so for one, two, three, definitely casting Ludovic further incentivizing opponents to attack each other, um, then the question becomes, do we want to attack an opponent with the archer? I think the answer is probably yes. Whatever our opponents have on board likely isn't um, threatening enough at this point that we would need to hold up a blocker and uh, just getting that extra card. Well, and, and not to mention that even if they do have a threat, Ludovic alone incentivizes them to attack someone else. So uh, I think I would probably start combat swing in, you know, assuming there's someone without a blocker. Uh, or sometimes if they do have blockers, I just straight up ask. I'm like, would you block my Death Toucher? The answer is probably no. I mean, Death Touch is pseudo-evasion. It's a disincentive to block at the very least. Uh, so deal two damage to someone, and then at the beginning of my end step because of Ludovic, we will draw a card for having poked an opponent. Uh, we will then, at the end step, uh, before our next turn, uh, flash in a dictate a crucifix. Get everyone drawn a few extra cards here. Um, we will untap on turn five. We will draw a font of mythos. Interesting. Uh, I, I, I guess probably next turn we'll want to cast the font of mythos first though. I think our first priority, let's see, we have one, two, three, four, five, six mana. Oh right, and we draw another card because of dictate a crucifix, and it's not a mace, so we must Sphere of Safety, also an interesting card to draw. Get that Pillow Fort engine uh, beginning to hum. But for, first and foremost, I think we want to drop that Collective Restraint. I, I, I guess it would only be our second, in, uh, or was our, I guess we only have three basic land types. Um, so we're, we're one away from maximum uh, effectiveness on that. The Sphere of Safety, on the other hand, would force opponents to pay two. But if we get the collective restraint out first, yeah, I think any way you slice it, it's best to get the collective restraint out. One, two, three, four. Uh, yeah, we will go ahead and drop this. Um, creatures can't attack us unless their controller pays X for each creature attacking us, where X is the number of basic land types um, that we have. Uh, so right now that's three, three mana to attack us. You also want to attack our opponents anyway because of Ludovic. And we have this Reacher, although this Reacher is going to be attacking anyway so that we can draw a card at our end step. Once again, the world-famous Keening Stone. Um, you know, maybe we also... Maybe we just get those gears a little greased with the Helm of Awakening during our turn, too. All right, why not make opponents... Uh, why not enable opponents, I should say, to play more things? You know, they're, they're already not going to come at us because of the collective restraint. That's a lot of mana already. And Ludovic, you know, further incentivizes. Yeah, I feel I feel comfortable playing that Helm of Awakening on turn five here. Uh, let's go to turn six on tap. We will draw main phase. Uh, might as well play this island here. Judgment call. You might not want to continue building out a fort. This might be enough of a pillow fort for now. You might want to just hold up the sphere of safety in case of a board wipe of some sort, hold up the Hornet Queen. What we can do, and what we almost definitely should do, is for one, two, three, four, five, six, because it costs one less, play a Boundless Realms. We're gonna search our library for one, two, three, four, five, six lands, and put them into play tapped 
forest island. Definitely getting a mountain. Three, four. Uh, oh yeah, well, no. Let's do another island. Five, and then another plains. Six. Do a little bit of organization. Bada bing, bada boom. Bada, 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 bada. Do that over there. Bring this over here. Blah, de, blah, de, blah. Get my cocoa up there. Why not? And uh, go on to turn seven. I mean, we're getting into a territory where it's a little hard to tell what's even going on. Maybe I forgot to draw two cards off of the Dictator Crufix last turn. Who knows? Uh, if we were playing an actual game, we'd go a little slower. <laughs> I, I don't hate the play Sphere of Safety into Possibility Storm here. That seems cool. Maybe get the Hornet Queen out of the way first because it costs seven mana. Uh, but yeah, all, all sorts of ways that we could take it from here. Let our opponents attack each other, draw everyone more cards, grease the gears to help opponents attack each other even more. Uh, Possibility Storm creates a very you know permanent, heavy, board heavy game state. Uh, yes, like this position. Keening Stone is in hand, so you know if we drop the Font of Mythos on top of a Dictator Crufix and let the game just kind of grind out for a while, then it becomes a viable win condition. And not to mention that we have the mana to drop it, tap it, activate, and then tap it, activate it again on our very next turn if we save it for an end step. Uh, yes, 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 yes. This is what we like to do. It's darn Ludovic. Also, I guess I left my Boundless Realms just sitting on the stack. That's fine. Um, <laughs> hug your mothers, give them a big ol' hug for me, and uh, good luck, have fun, this has been EDH Rec Tech, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe, subscribe so that you know when future content comes out every week, I'll see you same time, same place next week right here on Pogo Bat Gaming, like I said, good luck, have fun, remember, the real game is the metagame, and your place in you know, the social situation there, and the real win condition is having the most fun, so make sure... You're enabling all of your opponents to have fun too. Make sure everyone's having fun. Just be a good, be a decent person. Like competitive decks can be very fun. I'm not saying don't play competitive. I'm just saying be kind. Be kind to each other. I've been Dan Brown, and I will still be Dan Brown next week. Okay. All right. That's the end.